I first heard about this case through another uh, YouTuber. His name was Richie from Boston. And it was in December of 2017. I just heard him mention the case, and I thought it was interesting. And at first, I'm like, OK, um, maybe they just don't understand the, the medical terminology in the autopsy reports. So I figure, and then um, from there, I found the Facebook page. And so I went on there, and I looked at the autopsy reports. And I said, OK, I'll just you know do some videos and, and explain to these people what the autopsies mean, because maybe they're confused. I really was not expecting what I found. And then as soon as I started reading the autopsy report, nothing was adding up to the official um, uh, story, the storyline. It just didn't add up. And from there, it went from, yeah, this is not a murder-suicide. This is a triple homicide. And that was evident from day one. And uh, from there, I, I just started delving in deeper, and I haven't looked back. Well, that's very good. And, and, and just the preliminary information, Catherine, that I had looked at, I said, that doesn't appear to be a murder-suicide. Now, I'm not an investigator, but I do investigate, and I have a mind that looks at cause and effect. And uh, I was not impressed with the conclusion of the de police department. And as I understand it, and you may know, they came to this conclusion rather quickly. Yes, in fact, um, it is quoted in one of the online newspaper articles where the police chief determined within two hours, it states. Whether or not that's a typo, they didn't have it retracted and it was never changed. It said that they decided within two hours it was murder-suicide, and to me, that was beyond crazy. That seems suspicious, in my opinion. Yes. Um, not that I accuse the chief or anybody else but that seems to be almost like a foregone conclusion that everything is obvious, this is a murder-suicide. And that closes the case. Right. Which I don't think that's the need. I think there is need for, I hate to say it the way I'm going to, no offense to anybody in the police department, but a real investigation to look at the real evidence and see where it leads. Yes, and, and I agree, you know, and I've talked with Detective Sergeant Gummert a couple of times, and, you know, he really is a nice guy. He was always very professional. Um, you know, he never talked down, or never had an attitude. He was actually very polite, very professional. However, um, it was, it's just the lack of, of investigation, jumping to conclusions before they even had any reports back. You know, they leave the house with six casings and three bullet fragments and then determine and had already predetermined David was guilty when they still to this date are lacking the bullet that killed him and they had walked out that day with no physical evidence showing David was guilty of anything. Wow. And, and that says something to me. And I've noticed, now this is another case that I was looking at with Greg Philip Marshall, and I told him, you know, these cases kind of line up in how they happened and how the evidence is kind of there, and the police departments, both separate cases, separate time zones, separate everything, come up to similar conclusions in a quick fashion. I find that disturbing, and I find it disturbing in this case because it does no justice to the victims here which I consider them murder victims, all three of them. And I think each of these uh, points that you brought up, you know, how they were shot and the evidence on site and the lack of investigation is troubling, and especially with the evidence as it is based on what we see. And I'm wondering how or why they came to such a conclusion. Did you get any information from uh, the detective uh, that indicated that, oh, this is definitely it, and why? Or what was his offerings on this case? He just said that they came to a decision, and it's going to stay there. They, he said um, they believe they chose, uh, came to the right conclusion. They see no reason to look at anything else. They never saw a reason to look at anyone else. And they're content with their findings, and that's that they're done. And I was appalled by his response. That's scary. 
Yeah. And he's as professional as he is. And, you know, when you're trying to cover something up, you try to appear normal, you uh, try to appear authoritative, and you uh, try to allay fear that it's something else. Correct. But that, he, it seems like he didn't do anything to do that. He didn't offer evidence. He just stated the conclusion. <laughs> Yes, he he wasn't going to do anything. He wouldn't budge. He wouldn't even answer the question. I had sent uh, the police chief. I have sent the Dakota County Attorney, um, the Dakota Sheriff, the Dakota County Sheriff, and then the Minnesota State Attorney General. I've sent all of them, as well as uh, Detective Sergeant Gummert, uh, proof that we have found recently that shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that David was murdered. There's blunt force trauma on his head. And um, I kept asking him, do you see this? Are you telling me that you and your officers are investigators? Do you see it or are you telling me you do not see it? He wouldn't answer the question at all. He just simply went back to, we have our decision and we're sticking to it. Okay. And no, in, in the government in which I served, uh, you deny things and you stick to the party program, whatever it is. This sounds like a cover-up more than a decision and an actuality that they discovered that it was a murder-suicide. Now, that sounds like it's covering something, and that there might be a reason beyond what we're seeing, obviously, in this case, that they've come to that decision. And that stands out as a big red flag to me. It really does. And uh, I don't know why, when we go above to the attorney generals and so forth with these items and they do not respond and and I bet that that's a deference to the local department and they communicate and 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 they stick with this decision and uh, to me that's a very troubling sign for a police department especially when we see conflictory evidence presented like that and that to me is a very troubling thing. Uh, did you get to talk to anybody else, or was there anybody else on record who had anything to say about this case from an official perspective? Uh, no, I tried for over a week to get in touch with the police chief, uh, Wright Skull, and okay. he absolutely refused. He wouldn't even take my call. He's, um, I had to leave a message, and then that's when Detective Gummert uh, called me back, and uh. he's the only one, and he said that the police... It, this was in a previous conversation that the police chief was basically too busy and um, uh, right school had asked Gummert to take care of it. But oh. yeah, no, no one else would talk to me. In other words, get this lady off my back. I don't want to talk to her. That's how it felt. <laughs> yes. That's, that's how I look at it. And, uh, <laughs> I kind of get it that way. Um, because if he had been at least professional, as you're describing in this, uh, he would have called back and said, uh, I have, by my investigation, and due to certain things you don't know, which we can't talk about, come to this conclusion. In other words, they have evidence up. But the fact, I learned something from you just now, that he had blunt force trauma. Yes. This, along with the other evidence, with even out the blunt force trauma, I came to a quick conclusion as I looked at things in my research. I said, no, this was a murder. Uh, all three were murdered. Yes. And what purpose would there be and what motive? And Greg and I were discussing this. And in and, and, and the time that you're ready to do that, did you discover anything that would indicate why they all had to be killed? I thought if somebody had a you know, problem with uh, Crowley, in his perspective, uh, they could have, you know, X'd him out, killed him, whatever they were going to do, and leave the wife and the daughter. But it's interesting that the whole family was killed, and it would seem to me that somebody was taking him out and the wife walked in on it? I don't know. What evidence and what things do you purport or can find or have seen uh, that would indicate kind of how this played out? Did they have a scenario on that? Um, well, a lot of it is just going to be plain speculation because we, there's no way for us to know for sure. But what I've gathered from what I've found is um, 
my belief is, and I could be 100% wrong, but my belief system is, is that Kamel and Rania were used as pawns against David. They wanted something from David. David wouldn't give it up, so they, and they used the wife and the child. And then ultimately, um, we don't know who died. You know, we have a pretty good guess, according to the autopsies, who died first. Um, and, you know, um, you're looking at the stomach contents. David was completely empty. He had no food in his stomach at all. Kamel okay. did have a brown liquid. Rania had a brown liquid or tan. They call it a tan liquid for both of them. But she also had undigested food particles. So if you're going by rate of, of uh, stomach um, contents, I would guess, my best guess is that Rania died first and then Kamel and then David last. And uh, so it was one, very... I'm sorry, what? Died first, yeah. I'm sorry, what? I'm, excuse me for interrupting, but I was just uh, elucidating here. It was the daughter that died first? That would be my guess because right. she had... She yeah. had not only the same tan liquid that the mother had, but she had undigested food particles as well. So and digestion daughter, stops on, uh, on death. Right, and that's, what was the daughter's name again? Um, I say Rania. Um, I could be saying it wrong. Greg, how do you pronounce her name? Yeah, that's, that's right. You're saying it right. Okay. Rania. Okay, Rania. Good. And, and so the mother, Kamel, died. Those two died first then before he did. Yes. Okay, that would make sense if somebody was saying, give me information or give me something, whatever they were searching for, or, and he said, I don't have anything. And then uh, they kill them and then take him out. Um, and the evidence of the gun is one of the things that really made me base it uh, that it was a homicide because they said it was, a, it was found on behind his left hand or next to his left hand. Is that correct? Well, one of, one of the police reports states it was found a couple inches from his left hand, and another report by Detective Bone states it was found one foot south of his left hand. But, it, yes, it was on the left side of his body. Now, was he right-handed? Yes. That doesn't make sense. That's an obvious, I, I think, an obvious indicator that that was either... Uh, and, and that was the gun that killed the daughter and the mother. Well, that, you know, and Greg has done a lot of research on that, and that's something we really, by reading the reports, they're not really particularly clear on that. Really? Because they would have the, oh, the forensics to go over that. The patterns on the bullet would indicate if it came from that gun. It, wow. Now that, I, I was surprised, to, I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah, I mean, Greg has a lot of information on that. But the thing about the gun that gets me is that, you know, it, it was David's gun. It was registered to him. You know, it's his weapon, but yet his prints are not on it. Now, if he supposedly shot his wife and daughter and then himself, his prints would be everywhere all over that gun. And there are his prints nowhere to be found. <laughs> yeah, and the only print that they found was a, a latent fingerprint left in blood on the magazine, but that print did not belong to David. Another indicator that this was a murder. Correct. And, and uh, for the police to ignore these things, I, you know, uh, uh, let's just say this wouldn't pass muster on law and order. <laughs> oh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> not, not to put out a show on that, but uh, this seems totally aberrant and totally outside of police investigation and I watch a show by a uh, homicide hunter with Lieutenant Kenda. Oh, I just look, look at this and go, no, no, this is not the answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and obviously, even to a layman, uh, this has obviously holes running all through their story. And I've learned these other things from you tonight about blunt force trauma. And even without that, I knew this was murder uh, and not a... You know, he was a more stable a person based on some information I had gotten than to be someone to break and kill his daughter and wife when I understand he was a believer in the Most High and acted in that accord. And every family has disagreements and problems, but none of those were indicators of him reacting this way. Did you have information that supports that? 
Um, absolutely. There's a, another news article, um, and I believe they had interviewed Mitch Heil, which is his um, uh, grade school buddy. He'd known him for quite some time. And talking about David's career in the military, when he went in there for the last time, he'd been over sent to war a few times, and the last time he said he's done. He says he couldn't take another human life. He couldn't do it anymore. And so they put him into some menial little job because he absolutely refused to shoot another human. So that, wow. to me, does not ring wow. with someone who's going to turn around and then kill you know, his family. His daughter. Yeah. His wife. You know, if he was flipping out and had a PST type breakdown, I would see maybe killing his wife if there was something, maybe, due to some idea in his own head, but not his daughter. And the, the realities that I look at in that uh, really shine that he did not do this. And the question is, uh, what is being covered up. <laughs> he was working on a project, a film project, and I, I, I think, in my mind, it might have been tied to something they didn't want published and out there in public view, in my opinion. That's just not knowing what the content was, but based on the idea of what he was producing and getting ready to put out publicly. Uh, did you get any information along that line? Um, yes, and, and that's just it. I can't, you know, I can't say with 100% certainty was it, you know, a quote-unquote government hit or was it really about um, anger and personal revenge on, this, on the part of some of his uh, associates um, because, you know, as we all know, Danny August Mason uh, was, he felt he was entitled to um, quite a bit of uh, more substantial stake in the Gray State Project than what David felt he was entitled to. And he would not sign over a release. He just flat out ignored it and then would write back and say, well, yeah, I know you want me to sign this and, you know, hey, I need to think about this. Um, and, and that all started like once David received, or maybe it was before, David had received a, you know, the $30 million offer to just do the rise. Now that was only the rise. There was still a whole lot more money to come from the rest of the project. And oh. um, did, oh. so did, was Danny angry because he felt he was going to be losing um, money he felt he was entitled to? Uh, we don't, you know, that's again speculation. However, you know, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence, and this is for me and my opinion, and I, I'm, you know, strictly just me. This is not including Greg or anything else. But, right. you know, there's, uh, to me, there's more than enough circumstantial evidence that points toward Danny August Mason and Sean Wright. And when I was going through photos and I was looking through Danny August Mason's Facebook page, he shows a photo of his dog. Now, as you know, there was a blue blanket. And that blue blanket, well, as well as through the rest of the house, there were multiple and mostly white dog hair. Now, the family dog was not mostly white. He was mostly brown and shades thereof. Now, Danny August Mason posted a photo of his dog, which is a pure white pit bull, who had been, he rescued from um, a fighting ring type thing. The dog had been taught to kill and attack. And so I'm, and I sent this to the police too. I go, you know, you're looking for a dog, some, at least that has a lot of white fur. Paleo didn't have that much white fur. And this dog was trained to kill and to fight. And you have Danny August Mason who, you know, is at odds over the, you know, what he felt were his rights versus David's rights. And again, I'm not saying he did it. I'm saying this is, to me, strong circumstantial evidence that points, at least the police should have questioned him, and they didn't do it. What's interesting, too, is the missing hand and arm. And that would tie into a fact that I think of if that dog attacked and he wanted to get rid of evidence, what do you do? The arm and the hand would be taken, in a sense, to get rid of evidence. And with the white fur there, that's my thought. Don't know. Yeah, they, yeah, they would have to actually take that arm off. A dog could not, and not even that pit bull could rip that arm off that little girl. Oh, I know. Yeah, it was ripped that's from the true. socket. So, yeah, it, it was 
quite violent. This family was murdered in a horrendous way. And that, and that stands out to me. And now I begin to see a picture of if it was him and his dog, the dog was involved, that would bring some type of control into the situation where it would keep the family from doing anything to um, subdue him or the perpetrator, whomever it may be. And uh, this case now gets more and more ominous in its, in its uh, outcome and reasoning. And uh, from a police perspective, you would think, hey, we better find out who did this and not declare it a murder-suicide because whoever did this is psycho. <laughs> yeah. It has no taste to it, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and um, unfortunately, I had the unfortunate experience of con um, conversing with uh, Sean Wright via emails, and he's quite an angry, violent person, and um, he also is um, has a strong um, knowledge base of the Muslim religion, and that was another angle that the police never looked at. You know, they want to blame this on David because of the Allahu Akbar, which was on the wall, but there were several of, several of his friends that had, a, you know, a really strong, I don't know if you want to call it a faith, but they followed and read up on and would quote that religion quite often. And they that, never talked to them either. That is ignoring evidence. Yes. That's turning your eye away from the truth. And uh, what, is, what I'm seeing now is a clear picture of denial by yeah. the police department of following up on very clear indicative direction from the evidence that produces the fact that Mr. Crowley did not commit this crime. This is malfeasance at its highest order, in my opinion. Agreed. You know, and that wow. was one thing, you know, when I first talked to Sergeant Gummert the first time and he was making the comment, he goes, he goes, I know a lot of people go out there and they're, you know, all these conspiracy theories about it being a hit, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but it's not. And then the second time, which is actually on my video where you, I put out exactly what he stated, and I told him there, I said, you and I have discussed this before about, you know, and I said, I really fought against this being, you know, a, a hit of some sort. I go, but now you're leaving me no other choice but to believe that because you're not going to investigate the, the evidence given to you. You're stating you're content with your decision. And how can you be content when you see with your own two eyes that he was murdered? and you see where the scalp uh, fragment was cut away from his head. And Whoa. I said, you know, a dead man cannot do that to himself. And you're Absolutely. still going to turn around and ignore that. And, you know, and he's just like, yeah, okay, you know, I get it. And, and, and he's confronted with the evidence, so he just, he didn't say a word about that other than that. Oh, I get right. It. He, he, he wouldn't even talk about it. He wouldn't confirm nor deny it. In fact, I had sent that to them both at the same time, and the first time he called me back, he's like, well, I have to admit, he goes, I haven't read anything. I just glanced over it and just, you know, and then just closed out my email. And I said, well, you really need to look at those photos. It, it's kind of telling here. And then the, sec then the second time when he's like, you know, I just said, tell me, do you see it? And he's just like, All, we're, we're content with our decision. And one thing I'm noticing right now, next to the foot with the sock is a clump of hair, brown hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that very curious. Uh, that's not dog hair. It looks like human hair. Yes. And uh, did you look up that? And was that from, it looks like somebody cut it or it, you know, that obviously didn't just get there. It looks like it's not connected to anything, not to the skull or anything. But if it was, that means he couldn't scalp himself or cut hair after he did that unless he had shot himself and it blew a portion of his skull off. But there's no blood. There's that's from his hair. wife, though. That's, that's from his wife. Um, that, that's her foot there. So can okay. we assume that that's her, her hair? And does it look cut? Does it look like there's any? Well, it's, it, in it's that? by the foot, and I'm going. Her head would be quite a distance. Her, the head, other her head was almost completely gone. Oh, uh, okay. That's another so, weird thing. How did the hair get get what? there too? And is this from decomp, or is it 
And does it look how cut? How did the hair get any the foot is my question. And <laughs> how, they, how did the blood get on the foot? I don't know. Yeah, and, and <clears throat> I don't see the source for the blood unless she had, and it's something that she didn't step in. Unless she it's was like, turned over, right? Or it's like I she don't know. was it's, it's, laying in blood, and that her foot was in blood. Well, you know, um, my take on that is, and um, I did speak with a corner friend of mine, um, yes. and they said they said the same thing that Dr. Kelly had stated about that foot, and it's not blood per se. What that is, and both of them said the same thing without each other's knowledge of what was being said. So. Okay. Um, Again, this is a medical examiner and a deputy coroner. So and it's corroborated. Say, okay. I'm sorry, what? It's corroborated by their independent opinions. Yes, yes. And what they said to them it looks like is that um, the blood is coming from the skin underneath the sock. They said it looks like decomp fluid that is actually um, what is something called a bleb. It's where the skin... Um, starts to bubble and looks like a blister full of fluid and right. then the blood popped and then it seeped up through the sock and they both said the same thing so that would be something that of course not being a medical examiner I wouldn't know so that looks conclusive to be due to the time that they were there nearly three weeks my that makes sense yeah, yeah they do weren't they know, there three weeks do, do they uh, do they know based on this can they guess at least like how long this foot has been here, or the the decomp rate that would cause the blood to to do that. Like how how quickly or how late in the decomp process would would that happen? Do we, do we know that? Well, they both of them were looking at the rate of decomp on the skin, both on David's abdomen and on Kamel's leg that shows through the rip in the pants. Now you have to remember the foot is covered in a sock, so it's going to be a little hotter and. Right. It may or may not decompose a little bit faster. It's half on a rug and it's in a sock. So, you know, the, the skin will start to form these uh, blisters of uh, decomp fluid and then they will rupture and pop faster. But um, both of them uh, stated, even, you know, Dr. Kelly, when I asked him specifically, I said, were these bodies here for three weeks? He said, no. He said his best guess was four to seven days, ten days at most. And really? the, the deputy coroner stated the same thing. They said there's no way these bodies are decomped at a level of three weeks. They said not, no way. The, and even the uh, medical examiner in her reports for all three states the rate of decomp as early to moderate. And that still falls in, that falls in with anywhere from day one to day 10 or 11. Well, they were found on what? What was the date, Greg? Uh, they were found on January 17th, 2015, at, uh, I believe, about 12, almost 1 p.m. Okay, and the last time they were seen was he was working on something after, you know, he, he had taken time out, they said, from going to his brother's Christmas party and was no, staying at home to work on his problem. Yeah, he didn't. Right? They, he didn't go. Well, he didn't go to any of of the family stuff. I guess ever so, since thanks since Thanksgiving, he hadn't been to any of the family gatherings. And right. um, so I don't. I don't know. But he was working so, on this on this project too at the same but time. But the last time, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I said the 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 last time that that I know that he or at least the last time that I've seen it reported that he was seen is on Christmas Eve. Um, by the neighbor across the street. But this 10-day thing bothers me because that means that it was into January. Correct. Yeah, right. They would have had to have been killed at, what, on the, on the 10th or something, or somewhere around that January 10th. That they were held captive then. Yes, 7th of the, yes. They were, they were killed somewhere between January 7th and January 10th. Because their, their last, their last, um, internet activity in in the house or i think any activity in the house was i believe january 26 so we have a huge gap between january 26 and until the bodies are you mean december 26th yeah i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah i was about december to say 26th. january 26th Thank you. <laughs> sorry guys I'm really somebody was on there. <laughs> this is why <I'm>, yeah <laughs> december 26th 
So December twenty sixth. Okay, that's what my question was going to be. January twenty sixth. Unless they're time travelers, and no. <laughs> no <another>. Sorry. <laughs> I was getting kind of flummoxed there. I go, what? <laughs> January twenty sixth. The of my they, life. They resurrected then, and this is a no, <laughs> this was a no case. Um, I'm sorry about that. That's okay, <laughs> but that means that from the on the on, on or about the twenty sixth or after. And especially, I think it would be around the 26th or the 27th because there would have been continuation. So I'm thinking something or somebody stopped them from interacting at that point, and that means they were there. If you say say it was the 27th, and and somebody, and I'm assuming somebody did by the information we're seeing, came in there on the 27th. That means the 27th to about the 7th, you know. That's about, you know, 11 days that they were controlled by somebody trying to do something and it didn't turn out well for whatever purpose. So that means they could have been under, you know, duress and couldn't let anybody know and somebody was there. Now the question comes up, did neighbors notice anything from the 27th to the 7th of January? Did anybody notice any activity? Did anybody follow up on that as the police should have? and looked at this and went, wow, you know, did y'all see anything? Is there any information regarding activity around the house after the 26th? I don't think so. Yeah, not, it not that I can find. Yeah, and the reports, like, when they went to the neighbors and were talking about it, and the, as the police were writing that in their reports, all of the neighbors state they saw nothing, heard nothing, and, in fact, they didn't even notice the packages on the front porch until January 10th. Wow. Uh, Dan Jr. And they, and they dropped them off in December, but the um, the neighbors, through, at least in um, all of the uh, interviews that the police had written down, the neighbors all state January 10th. It's very consistent. Interesting. And, and there were there were six six shots that six shots that nobody heard. That's six shots, and that was from what size caliber of weapon? That's a 40 cal. That's a 40 a cal. 40. Hall that makes a pretty big noise. Uh, you know, even if it's inside, if you hear a 40 cow go off, Maybe. you're going to, unless, what? If there's a silencer. Correct. That could have been true. And I don't there, think there, it was the gun they found. So, Is there any, would there be any way to tell if the silencer was used based on the crime scene photos, based on the photos of the body, or is it just not even... Worth going it would down be hard to determine that based on the bullet or anything. Uh, and yeah, I think a lot of it we would have to really depend on the autopsy report and then the ballistics. But you yeah. know, um, since most of the heads were missing except for Rania's, um, and they did find a circular impression, but it was very nondescript. There's really no way to tell. Yeah, there wouldn't be, and. Oh, but they did find a circular impression on Rania's head. Correct. You said, but if, but if if they can tell the way, you know, because they 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 tell us how they think that these three people were shot. If they can tell that, like, or or are they just guessing on that too? What do you mean, Greg? Um. So I'm looking at the autopsy, and um. Uh, for for David Crowley, like they know where the bullet leaves, right? They don't know they don't know where it came, like, but they know where the bullet. Um, right, the is. exit wound is oh, there, right. but there's no way to tell where the entrance wound went. Yes. Yeah. So how did so how do they know that if there's like if there's so little of this body left? I guess is what I was wondering. Um, and then how are they able to? How are they able to guess that? I don't know. Well, and that's just it for both David and Kamel. The only thing the autopsy reports state is either um, the entrance wound where it would either entered, or, mm. or I think in David's case it was only the exit wound, and and they could see the hole at you know where the bullet left, and you can tell because of how it bevels on which side, and. Um, you know, but here they have Rania, and they can tell exactly the entrance to the exit on hers. Um, but yet, 
you know, there's so much speculation. You, you have some yahoos out there saying that the police said David was lying down when he shot himself in the head. And it's like, okay, I mean, just the body positions prove that theory completely wrong. It sounds like they're really just, with their information, confusing the issue. I'm looking at one photo here, and I'm seeing skull and a bone that's to the left on yep. their marker for number six, and I'm going, oh, that looks like a small bone there, and I was going, oh, that's interesting, and uh, I, you know, they say the dog was there, and it might have been he interfered with the scene. Did they, because uh, he ran out of food yeah, and they, water. And, yeah, they blame the dog on everything. The dog gets yeah, blamed for, for all of that, but, but the dog had food. It could have got, it had two big, huge bags of dry food right there. He could have ripped it open, too. Frankly, he could have. I, there's, I, it's really hard for anyone to really say, and and they don't they don't prove it. And that's what I don't like is they can say, well, you know, it's possible animal scavenging, but they're stating it as fact, but they're not showing any proof. They're not giving any that would be data for to back evidence. that up. They have to yeah. have evidence. Yeah, all they ha all all they would have to yeah. to do is show this dog feces, I mean, are maybe maybe they did the dog feces test and we just don't have them. But they would generally put that out, I think. This indicates that the dog did uh, consume and uh, trouble. But I guess if nobody asked, food. right, if, if, if nobody asked for those tests to be done, and then who do you, who do you ask for that? Is it... Well, the uh, thing about it is when you have an open and check case, oh, a murder-suicide... They're, they're not even worried about it. This counts a lot of... <laughs> yeah. This counts now, they, a lot now they're of just cutting doing. corners. Yes, yeah, and Brad, I want you to go back and look at that photo again, the one you were just talking about, the skull piece next to the yellow tent number six. Okay, let me go. Uh, okay, yeah, okay, here it is. What do we got? And look at the sides of that where the skin is attached to that piece of skull fragment. And this is the skull fragment piece I'm talking about. You can see um, impressions in that skull. And when you blow it up, you can actually see a pattern the patterns of the of the instruments used. But look on the side of that skin as it's taken away, um, and it's very straight. It's not ripped. It's not pulled. It's not chewed. You see nothing. You see a That's true. straight line. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And that is consistent with a knife. That is not consistent with being pulled, ripped, chewed off, nothing. It's consistent with a knife. Interesting. Interesting. And that's, that is David's skull fragment. So, and that's what I was asking Sergeant Gummer. I said, explain to me how he could beat himself in the head. I said, you see the blunt force trauma. Yep. So he's beaten the head, he's shot in the head, and then it's cut off. How does he do this? And he would never respond. This is an obvious cover-up now, uh, pure and simple. As I looked at this skull, I was going, wait a minute. And I, I was noticing the impressions to the left of the the crack there, and I was going, wait a minute, that that looks strange. And the fracture means that uh, this and, and the shattering of that skull. You know, a forty caliber will go in there. It can, it can do that if you got enough pump to. But that looks totally inconsistent with that. Right. The, the coroner I spoke with did say, because when you look at the top part of that skull piece where it's kind of jagged at the very top, yeah. they did say that that is consistent with a gunshot to the head, but the rest of it, you know, you've got, like you stated, there's a fracture and a really long fracture that goes down almost toward the center, and yeah. then they said the impressions themselves are not caused by gunshots. They said those are absolutely... Um, blunt force trauma. They, in fact, they said it multiple blunt force trauma, without doubt. That, that's what I was noticing. I'm thinking, I see indentation a little bit, and I'm going, that doesn't look at all. So if, so if, well, if people are looking at this photo right now, where, where should they be looking at to see these impressions? I'm going to try to add that photo to this. Um, you can see a really good um, impression when you look down toward the bottom left of that skull piece, but a lot of the middle part where it looks all dark, yeah. um, when you zoom in, you can see multiple um, uh, hits 
And um, a couple of those, you have to change filters. And I sent those to you, Greg, the photos when, you change, when I changed the filter um, and stuff like that. And you can actually see a six-sided either, it's either a socket or a crowbar. So that was used as well as when you look down, like I said, toward the bottom left side of it, um, you can see almost like a diamond pattern with a circle in the middle. And that's pretty consistent with either a ratchet or something like that, a ratchet or a wrench type of weapon, which is very heavy. And they were about a half inch, um, uh, yeah, half inch stuff. Right. I mean, guys who, who do tools, they know, they know what that means. Yep, and that, that in itself, that one piece of evidence is indicative. One, this was a murder. Two, that it wasn't David. And three, that whoever it was had, uh, you know, it's interesting. It means that, you know, when you're using a tool or something like that, they didn't, it didn't look planned in a sense when I hear that. Yeah. They had a gun, but, you know, this, that, that's a strange twist to me. And I thought, they're beating them and then shooting, so that means first the beating. So that Correct. means there was torture involved, a little bit of uh, breaking down the person for something, in my opinion. I agree. And um, I did a video on the blood spatter that I could find in the house, and... Um, what I found was medium velocity blood spatter and, you know, oh. uh, passive blood spatter. And I found nothing that was indicative of a gunshot wound, but lots of it that would be uh, actually helps to explain, you know, um, the, the beating. You know, the uh, blunt force would leave the blood patterns you see on that floor. Right. And uh, it's interesting because blood splatter from a gun uh, is much more high velocity. Yes, it's like little fine mist in a, in a way. Not, not too fine of a mist because then that would, you know, that would be breathing it out. But yes, it's, yes. And so with the blunt force trauma, that's another indicator, you know, he's not going to beat himself in the head. <laughs> right. right. So this is, uh, I don't know how they can even possibly get away with this. Uh, I don't know why the upper levels of government whom you contacted and gave this information do nothing. Um, that's indicative of something, which I'm not going to tap into right now, but that means this is bigger than the local police department. And this is something that we don't have the information on and does indicate that this could be something of a, I wouldn't maybe say government, it could be something else that, and I don't know what he was involved in, and uh, I, I don't look at it as that his friend who was getting cut out of money would gain anything by killing him, uh, unless he was kind of off kilter. Well, he thought he was going to be able to take over Gray State and then put uh, get it out under his name. And really? You, yeah, he can't do that. And, you know, it, it was David's, and it's copyright stays with that person for 70 exactly. years after death, and I'm not sure he knew that. And, and the thing about it is killing him wouldn't have... I mean, you've got to deal with, you know, you've killed three people, and it, that's not going to go away. And you can't cover it up, and evidence indicates there was, this is a murder, obviously, in my opinion, and this murder gets covered up. Uh, how does one who, if it was him, how did he accomplish that? That would be almost impossible for somebody from his perspective would well, be able why, to be. Yeah, see, that's why I believe it was not, this was not done by one person. These murders no. were not committed by one person. That's and so... And I have seen where people have killed for a whole lot less than $30 million, a whole lot yeah. less. Um, yeah. You know, I had a friend um, when I was 14, and uh, they, were, they were into pot and selling stuff like that, and then they decided they were going to go clean, and they weren't doing that anymore. And they had 
two bullets put to the back of their head because they simply walked away and that was it. And so people will kill for the smallest oh. of things. Yep, if it is a possibility that they'll be turned in by somebody who left the system and they make a pact with people that nobody leaves, kind of like a mafia thing. Yeah. You go in if you don't leave. That's yeah, blood in, blood out, yeah. Right, and the thing is, and I don't, based on his belief in the creator, I don't see him getting involved in anything like that. But others around him, that, you know, brings up the uh, problem of maybe somebody who was uh, involved with maybe some nefarious ones who, was a, who were expecting a payout on this little project may have been involved. Now, that's just a you know, a gander at a possibility. But, yeah, it's uh, a definite possibility, that's for sure. I don't think we can really rule anything out at this stage. No, and the police aren't going to do anything with this. Nobody is. This is one of those things like Philip Marshall that just gets buried. Um, and the thing that bothers me is why? Why discount three lives, three human beings, and just say, oh, they don't matter? And that's what's upsetting about this case. Yes, three innocent lives, and then the murderers are still walking the streets. And people, you know, in Apple Valley, Minnesota, should be concerned. I mean, these guys are still out there. Absolutely. And, and based on what they're doing, and, and uh, it's interesting that the police, you know, who were supposed to protect the community, uh, letting something like this go shows somebody is either very well connected and has great power and can suppress it, or it's at a government level, which I don't see evidence of government in it at all. Um, government is, is more like the Philip Marshall case. It looks that it could really be a suicide, and I've told that to Greg on the Philip Marshall case. This stands to reason that it is not a murder-suicide. This is an obvious, very demented, and very diabolical murder. And it could have been they were imprisoned in that house, beaten, and then, and then finally murdered when they didn't get what they were after, whatever it was they were after. Or if it was punitive based on the fact that he was not going to relinquish you know, uh, and I think David, being who he was, if it was something like relinquish this uh, to save his family, I, do, I wouldn't see it above his heart to do that. Yeah, I agree, unless they left him no other choice, you know? Yeah, exactly, like they, they were known entities to him and his family, and they said, let's leave no evidence behind. Mm -hmm. Nobody to come back against, which would be an obvious choice for them once they went to that depth of beating and torture. Uh, it's obvious that, you know, some would not uh, want to uh, let that go. And David might have been one that would they knew may have, you know, gone to bat by going to the police and covering this to protect his family, uh, which would be my thought, too. So uh, that stands to reason. Yeah, because he, he always, you know, I, well, I can't say always, I didn't know him, but I had watched um, Eric Sayward put out this little video the day I met David Crowley. And his camera guy, you know, makes this really weird request to David, and, you know, he's just like, it, to me it creeped me out. Maybe somebody else wouldn't think it was creepy. I thought it was pretty creepy. He's like, where's your daughter? I want to meet your daughter. And David looks at him, he looks back, and you could tell he's looking at, his, at Kamel and, and Rania, and he turns back and then puts his body, physically moves his body between um, Kamel and then the guy, and he's like, no, they're not comfortable with that. They're, they're, they're not feeling comfortable or not feeling safe or something like that. To me, that was really telling. I mean, A, why would that guy want to go and meet the daughter? Wait that, a minute. Yeah, that, it makes no sense at all. That, and, yeah is highly strange. Yes. He wants to meet the daughter. He's standing right next to the daughter and Kamel. Well, right. there's this, 
Kamel and Rania were toward the back. You can't really see, okay. them, or at least I can't really see them. But he's like, hey, no, where's your daughter? I want to meet your daughter. And David, you know, you could tell he's kind of taken aback, like, well, why are you asking me that question? And David looks over his shoulder, or he turns around or something, and then he physically moves his body and then is kind of like standing in front. The guy says, no, um, they're not feeling safe or they don't feel comfortable. You know, and, and I'm just like going, if, if that guy asked me that about my daughter, I'm afraid I'd punch him even if he had a camera in his face. You know, it's just very weird. Just strange. Um, yeah. I don't see the purpose in that whatsoever or why he would want to meet the daughter. He was there doing a job, and what would the daughter have to do with that? Is, exactly. Uh, it, yeah, that, I would have reacted the same way. And the common denominator between all of those people and David, Sean Wright. And Sean Wright is a strange one, I hear. Yes, he is the common denominator. Uh, Eric knew Sean, David knew Sean, and then they just, you know, Eric uh, just supposedly showed up at the park to, to start filming people just on a whim, and then there's David, and then they asked that really weird question. Yeah, I, I don't believe in coincidences. No, the police, as they say, there's no such thing as co coincidences in murder investigations. Yep. And uh, that, that you know, I, my curiosity is spiked to the height at why they are covering up this murder. That's a plain statement I'll make. Yeah, and I don't understand. I, I am totally dumbfounded. You know, I really tried to give them the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, even when I would write them and I would say, you know what, I understand maybe you guys were overwhelmed. You know, you're a small town or a small province or whatever. And, you know, you had six murders or seven murders within 13 years. You really weren't that experienced. So let's give you the benefit of the doubt. But here, here's what we found. And then they just shut it all down and go, nope, we're not even going to respond. And we're content with our findings. That, yeah. that tells me there's not going to be any further investigation. And the thing that bothers me is the fact that when you kicked it higher, nothing happened. And right. The first time I sent it to the Minnesota Attorney General, they wrote back and stated that um, they voted as a state or whatever that each individual city or county would take care of their own stuff and that the uh, Minnesota Attorney General would not interfere with you know anything else. And I sent it back to them again and I said, you know what, I looked up your statutes and I looked up what your job is supposed to be and yes, this is part of your job, so you need to do your job and figure this out. And I haven't heard anything. They're going to ignore you. Probably. That was their statement. They, they stated that's, it. That's awesome, though. I'm so glad that, that you did that. That's awesome. That, that makes them I accountable. Yeah. And that yeah. makes them accountable. And I have a hard time it. sleeping now. Yeah, definitely. And, and if I was an attorney awesome. general and I had gotten this information from you, I would have gone down there personally to that police department and said, who's the investigator that wants this investigation? Yeah, but then they'll, they'll target you, though. That's, you got to be careful. <laughs> that. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. They start, they start, so they, they put you on the list. This is one of the most disturbing cases I have ever seen. It really is, um, and that's why it's, it's important to get as many people uh, just, just, to, just to look at it. I think once people start looking at it, it's just, there's, there's just more to it. Well, I hope has done, has done a great on the rest of the nation, uh, police departments handling things like this. You know, I'm here in Waco, and I saw the way they handled, you know, uh, David Koresh, which was totally out of bounds. Oh, and yeah. I, uh, I won't go into that because I have very strong feelings about how the local PD, the sheriff, uh, the ATF, yep, the and everybody did. They were assaulting unnecessarily a group of people who had weird ideas, okay, and they had guns, hoorah, so what? <laughs> and they weren't going out forcing or using those guns on anybody. They were doing practicing, and they were saying they were preparing for the apocalypse. Let them prepare. You don't provoke. And the way they did, they provoked the reaction they got. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one what? of these things, I'd like to talk to you about the David Koresh thing. That would be what? interesting. We oh, have yeah. feelings about that as well. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I can go over a lot of things at that. And yeah. I'm going to go out to the site now 
that I brought it out. I'm going to go out to that site. They have a plaque out there, and they still have people that meet that were part of that group out here. Yeah, the Branch Davidians, yep. And I would like to meet some of them and bring them in and question with you, me, and Greg on this issue. But I would too because actually <laughs> my, my history is, is I was a Seventh-day Adventist for years and the Branch Davidians were actually part of the Adventist church until 1935 when they were excommunicated due to what they were teaching. The Adventist church said, no, you know what, you need to get out of here. You guys are kind of wackadoos. And they truly, truly are. I mean, they're, they're way out in left field. Yep. And some of the things that David was doing, um, David Koresh, that is, was doing out there was completely against the law. But I agree with you. What yep. they did was antagonistic, and it was horrible. And they needed to get David, but not kill the whole group of them. That was, Correct. I mean, there's a, he was outside of that compound many times, and they could have gotten him and, and made their case. But I think they wanted to destroy that group, in my yep. opinion. So yeah. they just wiped them out. And I bet there was local consultation about it. What do y'all want us to do with this? Why and were they a threat? Why, what did they do to make themselves such a big target? Well, one, I'm going to bring up some things. They had a compound. Okay. And it was a gated, heavily you know, built, large compound. I'm sure that made neighbors kind of nervous in a way. It would have me if I'd have been out there and heard all the, you know, your automatic weapons, which doesn't bother me, but when you know there's a crazy group of individuals uh, called the Branch Davidians, and you look up their history, you go, oh, great, they're in my neighborhood? This is weird. <laughs> yeah. That, personally, to me, I would have gone to the sheriff and said, make sure they don't go rogue and go crazy out here. <laughs> so I'm sure there was some local input in that, and then when you put the thing that he was, quote, unquote, pedophilic and having sexual relations with 12-year-olds and that, that began to ire people locally, I'm sure, if they suspected that or saw yeah, things that like would that. ire me. So, sure. so I, I think there was input, but they still didn't need to do it the way they did, even with that information. Exactly. Uh, so I, I know why they wanted to deal with it, but they dealt with it with, you know, they took a nuclear bomb to a gnat issue. And right. That's my view of it. And they killed many innocent children and mothers and people who could be leaving productive lives and continuing, uh, and, and that just makes me feel sick. There's innocent blood in my county on that and the government's hands, not that their hands are clean anyway, but um, yeah. there's a lot of things there. So, um, but uh, let me r circle back now, because <laughs> I could talk all night about this, and I go, I call, uh, we're talking about Crowley, and I want to center back on Crowley again, and in the same way here, we see an incident where local police, like in the Waco issue, have some involvement in an issue which is obviously not the correct conclusion. Now, and you've only talked to one who, you wanted to talk to chief, the chief does not want to talk to you, and then delegates it to his detectives to get you off his back is all I'm going to say. Correct. Deal with it, but get you off the back and, uh, you know, this is the official decision. In other words, he was telling you to stop it. In an exactly. Indirect way. It's an indirect thing that says, no, you're going against the official decision. Whoa. No, this is, we are content. Don't, in other words, you're poking this pig, leave it alone. Did you get that feeling that, did he give any type of vibe that said, stop this? Uh, yes, uh, to me that vibe um, was the moment he absolutely refused to answer the question and just kept going yes. back to, you know, no, it's not going to be reopened and we we believe, we, and I told him, I said, you know, well, you should believe anything. <laughs> you should have evidence to back it up. And uh, Belief has to be based on facts. Yes, yeah. <laughs> And unfortunately, I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to back down. I'm not the kind of person who's going to stop. And I will keep going and, and keep talking about this because you know, I feel like Greg was saying earlier, you know, if we get this out there and the more people who hear about it, 
then people are coming to their own conclusions. The vast majority look at this case and go, oh, whoa, no, that, the police got it wrong. What and do you have in the local? Yeah. Have you taken this to the local newspaper in their locale? What kind of response do you get if you did, or have you? Um, I did. Uh, I am in touch with one of the reporters out there. Yes. And um, I asked, you know, and I, just today I'd asked them if they had uh, received, um, it had actually gone in and watched the video I made about the um, the blunt force trauma. Good. And they wrote back and they and what I asked them, I said, have you had an opportunity to watch the video where I spoke with Detective Sergeant Gummert regarding the David Crowley case? If so, what are your thoughts? And this person responded, quote, I have, none of it surprises me. <coughs> uh, that makes me wonder real quick then. Uh, yeah. Something is amiss there then that he is aware of. And I and now, if that doesn't surprise him, what kind of oh wow, what kind of local government have they got there then? That yeah, I, I don't that know. Is a dangerous thing then. Yeah, and I don't want to mention this particular person's name, just so you know, because I'm trying to work with them to see if they will write a, another article or not, and maybe they can bring to light because I sent them everything I sent to the police. Right. And um, so I'm, I'm still hopeful, you know, I, I always a hopeful one, that this person will write another article. Now here, where I live in Colorado, two of the TV stations out here contacted me, but at the time, they were asking me if there was um, a lot of interest in the case and what did I have, and at the time, I didn't have anything, not really, it was right when I was first starting right. um, doing all of this. And they said, if anything changes or if I get more information, to definitely contact them because they would then really consider doing um, a, a news piece on it. An expose is what yes. it would be. <laughs> so there, there are two stations here where I'm at that, that are very promising. I would follow up with them, too, yes. definitely, and with that reporter locally if he is willing. Yes. And with it not being a surprise to him, he might be afraid to do I think there's a factor that he's aware of that we are not. And that stands out to me very strongly. And that's another reason why I don't want to give their name. I don't even want to give the sex that they are because I don't want anything to come back on this particular person if it is something like that. I just don't think it's fair yeah, to them. It, it could be a danger to them, maybe yeah. realistically. And yeah. you're wise. That's good. I would follow the Colorado angle then with your stations. Yep. Uh, and uh, I, I really think this does need to be pushed. I feel a real upwelling in my heart, even, you know, because this is a fellow brother that was uh, executed yeah. and tortured and then murdered ruthlessly with his family. And a little girl, why do you kill a little girl? Yeah. A five-year-old girl. You know, you get rid of the parents. And, and you blow them away because they know and they can... But a five-year-old, um, if that just really tears at my heart because yeah. it's a child. And uh, this case is one of those that needs to be taken from the locals and given to the FBI <laughs> if it's possible. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I say that with trepidation because... Uh, it depends on where this came from that this was like this. You know, sometimes going a direction that you think will work actually makes it worse. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying there, I believe. And uh, it's got to be handled, and I think the best way is get people that really like the former investigative gentleman by the name of Cooper. I, you may be aware of him. Um, and uh, who really gets to the truth and brings it out, and I think he was executed for that. But um, that's neither here nor there. But the point is, this case, this one especially, is troubling and needs more light thrown into it to bring out these facts that the police and the state at the district attorney level are turning a blind eye to because this stinks badly. And uh, there needs to be a house cleaning in that state, and it might take this action you're doing and Greg going this way 
to bring the evidence necessary to get them to move. If you get a public opinion going, what the heck are you doing? And why aren't you looking into this? And the local community gets in an uproar about it. Uh, that may move them eventually, maybe. Yeah, that's and, the hope. And I pray successfully there, Catherine, because this, you know, uh, given the extra things that I have learned here tonight, this is an atrocity and, and, and needs to be found out who brought this about, why, and they need to be removed or executed <laughs> in the prison system or put away for life because these people are not the kind of people you want to be walking around on the streets. I agree. Definitely. And is there any other point that you can bring up, you know, not, uh, not just evidentiary, but anything surrounding David that you found uh, other than Mr. Wright there? Sean, you said his name was Sean Wright? Correct. Sean Wright and Danny August Mason. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Sean seems like a possibility to me. And uh, as you say, uh, he had the dog. And they found that was you. Danny. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Danny. Yeah. I'm sorry. My mistake. My misunderstanding. Uh, so this is an area that they need to follow up on. And uh, with those individuals who look like they had an interest in doing this. And uh, this, I think, could be that direction you speak of in that because Torture would mean sign this, do this, sign it over to me, or else. You know, maybe uh, he had that type of mentality and wanted to get his due, and he did this. But the fact, the fact is, though, why would the police not investigate and clear and get this person if they had an indicative, well, or that it was indicative that it could be him and not research that and dig into his background and dig into his whereabouts on this. Uh, did any of these people have alibis that, or, or did the police even talk to him at all? Uh, they, a question Greg, Greg, yeah, Greg, correct me if I'm wrong. I think they only mm -hmm. spoke to them when they were asking them about David. And of course, at first they're like really nice and sweet and, you know, oh, he was such a good guy. And then their story starts changing and then they start you know, really talking bad about David. Um, but the police never, ever looked at anyone else. And that's what I was asking Gummert. I said, you know, I said, I gave you really good, strong circumstantial evidence. And yes, it's circumstantial, I said, but it's enough that you guys should have at least, or even now, look into that to rule them out. Because at this stage of the game, you can't. And he just, again, kept going back. The only thing he would say is we, we believe in our decision. Oh, boy, and he's a liar. I, I don't believe him. I don't think he believes in it whatsoever, but that's the statement that they're told to give. Uh, that's an instructive statement, not a heartfelt statement. Yes, that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like he was given a narrative and said to stick to that no matter what, and he wouldn't deviate off course. Yes, if you're lying, you have to stick to the story. Yep. <laughs> and just keep saying it till people believe it. And unfortunately, I'm one that never believes somebody that does that once I have indications that that is not true. That means he is part of a conspiracy to cover up a very heinous crime. Uh, and the police department, and those who know of this case anyway, are covering up for somebody or a group, as I think you're correct in saying there was more than one person involved in this. And since it was over a number of days, and the thing that nobody noticed anything was that people came in there secretively, quietly, at night, or at a time when nobody was aware or could be aware that they were coming in and going out or traveling to there. Because this is, uh, has, as I said earlier, stinks greatly and uh, needs some further investigation, not only further investigation, but an investigation of those who do not want to follow up and why there also. It, it, this would be a big uh, indicative thing of that the state is not doing it and why. 
and especially when you presented copious amounts of very strong evidence to the contrary conclusions of those in the local police department. So this is something that is bigger than that local <laughs> and bigger than the state situation. So this indicates why does the state and the locals not want to do this? Have you asked questions like that? Being that you have the information, you go, okay, I have all this information. Now tell me, you, you could, this is off the record, and you could do it that way and say, what do you think really happened? Because I know you don't believe what you say. Have you gone that direction with anybody? No, not yet. I have not. You know, I would try that tack. Say, this is off the record. And I would keep it off the record in that way, but tell us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell us. Uh, but I, I would try that out and, and just go back and say, you know what? Off the record, no spilling the beans on you. What's your personal opinion? And just say, I don't have a recorder, not recording, and then just tell me what you think about this case and what you would think of somebody if they did this to your family, what you would think. Put it in his court. I, I That's think, a good idea. You know, because when people get that, you'll get the discomfort that comes with what they're doing. There will be some reaction, I think. You're, it's called touching their heart. And if you touch their heart with the question and say, if this was your mother or your sister or brother and niece, just tell me, how would you feel? You know, it, it, think about it. Yeah, make it personal. Yeah, make it make him feel what is wrong with this with this picture, because when you put a question like that and you say this is off the record, sometimes they'll break a little bit. Maybe not totally, but they'll say, "Well, I, I kind of feel that way myself." I can't tell you anything. Ooh, well then you've gotten an admission, at least that you know of, and you can tell us who it was, when it was, what they said. And we have cooperation with us that can say, hey, we got something. We won't talk about it publicly, and I would honor the, you know, no spilling the beans. But then you could diary that somewhere, and I would too. And then that would give a cause later on where we could say, why don't you bring this up in your locality and say your heart on that and get them to talk there. Now, I don't know if he would do that or not, and probably not in reality based on what I'm hearing. But it, I think that's a direction you might want to consider and prayerfully think of and see how it works out. Yeah, it, it can't hurt to try. I always believe, you know, you got to try. You don't get a no until you ask a question. Right, um, it's how you ask them and what yeah. you ask. The Savior did that. He would ask the heart-touching question, and yeah. that's why I bring it up. Bring it to them as theirs. This is yours. And, 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 and this is your heart, and this is your thoughts, and your family, and your people. If somebody did that like that to your family, or to your wife and your daughter, what would you want done? And, and, and that will get a response. And it may, if he gets angry, know you've hit a nerve that he knows he's wrong. Because anybody that gets angry when that kind of thing comes up, it means it's indicative that they're covering something, they don't like it, and, they're, and it just strikes that heart nerve in such a way that they lose it because they know they're doing something wrong and you're hitting on the nerve that speaks to them on it. And so I'm curious to see how that would come out. Well, I am too now. <laughs> I'm glad we've had this discussion because it's giving you a little bit of ammo but be careful how you do it, too. Um, you know, I, I said this to a group when I was in San Leandro. We're touching on things that they want to keep quiet. We have to be cautious because uh, I don't want to make anybody a target <laughs> for any Uh I wouldn't want anything to happen to Greg, me, or you based on this. And, of course, we have the protection of the Spirit because the Father will not allow anybody to be touched who are doing his will. There's that protection. And it's not like we're just dealing with worldly things in that uh, we're, we're surreptitiously doing things. We're doing this to honor the Father. This is why I do these things. And I pray that protection and spirit be there.
for you as you go about this and words it in such a way that it gets the right reaction and justice for these three victims of murder. And I, you know what, and I really agree. My faith base is, is here. Um, there are so many times I should have been dead. I shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> me but too. For some reason, yeah, for some reason God has seen fit to keep me alive. And maybe this was why, you know, especially the last time when I should have died. And even the doctors yeah. are like, uh, somebody up there wants you alive because we have no medical explanation as to why you're here. But maybe yeah. this is it. This yeah. is what I keep thinking. And if this is what God wants me to do, and if something happens to me because I'm doing his will, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with I, that. That's the way I am. I told Greg, they can come and get me. They can kill me, and, or you, or Greg, and just get rid of all of us. But guess what? What's still standing after we're gone? The truth. The truth. And the, the truth, truth will fall on them and grind them to a powder no matter how they do it. <laughs> yep. And Jesus tells us to only fear those. He says, don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill both body and soul. There and it is. That's they, right. Yeah, they can't kill my soul. Only God has that power. So no, I don't fear them. kill your faith. And when they kill you, they just make you more powerful. Exactly. And then you work on the other side, which, mm, you know, I was looking. <laughs> hey, and that's true. Yeah. And the thing about it is, I was looking online at the demonic activity of the magicians and everything. It's getting more popular, and they're getting more out about it and talking about it. And yeah. I see this as the progression to the end times when they're going to look at people like us and say, Oh, they're the problem. They're the ones. We get rid of them, we'll all be happy. Yeah. Oh, why don't we do that? And there are some that think of that today in government, believe me. Oh, yeah. One of those Christians in that Bible, oh, we'd have a happier, more peaceful world. Yeah, right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really am so appreciative that you came on this show tonight, this program. It isn't my show. It is the Father's. Uh, I can't take any credit for this. Well, you know, Greg says it's my show. Like, yeah, right. This is the Father's. It's a collaborative effort that we do to bring out the truth. And it's his show. And, and I'm so thankful that he's brought me in to be part with you guys. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get people like um, uh, um, Ben Nunn. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him or, or uh, Tom Horn and others. And this is all tying into the principalities and powers and darkness in high places. And, and what we're dealing with here, Catherine, is part of that structure. Yes. The principalities and powers and darkness in high places. We're not fighting against individuals with this case. This is deep darkness that we're dealing with. And we're dealing with the realm of Satan and spirits. And whatever we see physically is just evidence of their participation in things like this. Amen. And, yeah. and, yep. and I pray uh, in these programs that I bring the right truth, the right word, that people will go, hey, hey, wait a minute, I need to think about that. Because they do. You know, the things we hear, and I'm going to diverge a little bit, please excuse me on this. But when they talk about UFOs, no, demons. Bigfoot may be a cryptid of or could be supernatural or a combination of both, and it's not good in either case for us. And we need to look at things that are there and Ask questions like Admiral Byrd when they went down to Antarctica. Why did that happen? And there's lots of things that people just close the book and go, don't look over there. And we have to look at, because as believers in these end times, it's going to be as the days of Noah. What were they like? And I've discovered it a lot through uh, Steve Ben Nunn. And uh, uh, let's see, who was the other one? Uh, uh, Steve Quayle and, and uh, Marzulli and Greer and few that I have looked at and vetted and went, oh, this lines up, oh, this is, oh, okay. And so I am very much energized in these days as I see it affect government. And the more you know Satan's involved, the more division there is. And that means our government right now is being infiltrated by Satan himself because it's breeding division. And I know that's one of his best tactics to bring destruction is division. Oh yeah, divide and conquer, and he's got that down yeah. to a T. Yes, and that's what he did in the garden in the beginning. Same tactic, 
every yep. time. And, and he got Eve to question. That kind of separated her from her husband. And then her husband was right there. And then he followed her. And it was just what happened. And, and we need to see clearly our objective, which isn't just justice for this, but justice worldwide uh, is the eventuality. And that will come. And, and I'm thankful that, that the Father told us what was going to happen, or otherwise I'd be pulling my hair out looking at it. <laughs> but I'm aware, and I've had experiences, which later on I, I may, when we get off the program, so to speak, that I can kind of share uh, that I have been through, which have been direct things that I have encountered in my life of a spiritual nature. I have talked to Greg about it, and they're, they're very poignant, strong, and uh, I definitely knew what I was dealing with. And it was, a, 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 it didn't scare me per se, but it, it got my attention. That I state unequivocally, it did. Yeah, Greg so. actually brought that up to me uh, a little while ago, and he'd asked me if I would be willing to, um, I believe it was speak with you about that particular subject, because I myself have uh, <laughs> quite the story. And at the time, I told him, I was like, I just, could, I couldn't do it at the time. But, you know, that is something I think I'm about ready I, I actually would feel comfortable or okay speaking about now. So one of these times we should do a show on that. Right, I, I agree. Because people need to understand the battle we're in, and that's why I'm putting it out there. I don't want any notoriety for it. I don't care for money or that. It's just something that believers need to be aware of. Because um, churches don't, you know, not that they're ignoring it totally, but they only deal with it if a member comes up and goes, oh my, oh, this is what I, oh, oh, oh. Then they deal with it. It's not something they preach on how to deal with when you're in it. And that's important for us to bring those out. And at the appropriate time, then, Catherine, let's, let's do that. And I would be more than happy to do it. Let's enter it prayerfully, because I don't want to glorify the situation oh, or glorify gosh. anything dealing with it, but just put the facts out there. And, yeah. and let people read the word and vet our stories. And that's what I always say. Heart talk, don't believe us, go check it. Because when you, when you check it, if we're telling you the truth, the spirit and the word will confirm our words if we're speaking the truth. Yeah. And that's what I want to do, stay in that night. So if you ever hear me say something that's kind of out there, don't, and I know you wouldn't, I wouldn't be, feel shy about going, excuse me, wait a minute, wait a minute, where, where, where do you find that? Uh, where, does that where does that confirmation in the Word come from? <laughs> I'm about exposing the truth and about if it exposes me. And I go, ooh, well, ooh, ouch. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm wrong. <laughs> go figure. I'm well, wrong. And, and yeah, and that's just it. We're all wrong at some point in time, right? We're probably well, more wrong than we're right. <laughs> well, we're, we're coming out of our wrongness slowly. It's like, it's like a copper wire that's all bent, and the stator gets it and starts to stretch it. It gets hot. It gets straighter and straighter, but not without pain. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, and I've had some of that. And um, I've shared some things with Greg in the past. And he's aware of my foibles and things. He's worked with me closely in uh, family radio way back there. And uh, I got him on this path. Did I, Greg, get you kind of on this path, or am I off a little bit? I don't know. Um, I, I think but you definitely I kind of helped me on it. it. I think you helped me on it, for uh, sure. I helped him by just giving little things, testing him in the beginning about 9-11 and things like that. And, yeah, and by not calling me crazy or just <laughs> telling me that I was just wasting my time doing, you know, researching any of this stuff or anything. So, yeah, yeah I, definitely. Uh, and At the I, very least, you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you, you really did. You really did a great deal for me. Well, I'm glad, but it wasn't really me. The Father works in that. I can't take the credit uh, because he was cueing you in this, and that's what led to this and Catherine and this. And the Father may have a specific purpose for us doing this together and working with others. And Catherine, I recommend reading Pandemonium's Engine, Tom Horn, and Forbidden Gates, Tom Horn. He's a believer. And you need to read those books because it will prep you for what's ahead. Uh, I recommend them very highly. Okay. I'm Tom not Horn not. and uh, Pandemonium's Indian and Forbidden Gates. Oh, awesome. Greg, you too. And we'll talk about those once y'all get through that 
whenever you can. Uh, that would be awesome. And Sounds I would good. Really we'll do a little book club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do a little review. Do a little review. A little review. A book uh, review, yeah. for sure. Is there any final words, Catherine, that you would put that puts the stamp on this? I want you to do that. Uh, well, on the I I, 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 sorry to, to interrupt you. I definitely yeah. wanted to ask Greg because Greg said he wanted to, to cover the blue blanket. What exactly oh. were you wanting to talk about? Oh, yes. Yes, we need to, let's make that our final thing here. Um, the okay. The blue blanket. Tell me um, about the blue blanket. Yeah, can you, Catherine, can you tell us about what, because you were the one that really got me going back and researching more about this blue blanket, and the more that I researched, the more I'm thinking, I think you got something there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, it just, it was something that one of those oddities or inconsistencies I found when I was researching and reading the reports. Now, the blue blanket is a, um, and I don't know whose blanket it was, but it was a blanket that was covering David's legs, completely covered his left foot, his right foot was partially exposed, but yet it was under Kamel. And this blank, and I'm like, okay, how could he have shot himself and then positioned himself so he's under a blanket and it ends up just right so it covers his legs and, and, and none of it makes sense at all. And then you find out when you're reading the reports too that her left hand slash arm is underneath her body and again it's laying on top of this blue blanket and this same blue blanket is on top of her husband. David's underneath it. She's on top of it. Now, how did that happen? Wow. Yeah, and if her yeah. hand, left-handed arm, which David's legs was right next to her left arm, and her hand is positioned underneath her abdomen, where the dog has no access to that hand at all, but yet they're saying the dog ate the hand, how? It's under the body. It's missing, but yet it's still placed under the body. Which Wait a minute, her hand, hand was under the body and was missing? Yes, so that oh. means that, that hand was missing prior to body placement. That's and I indicative thought, again, of what I was thinking. Somebody yeah. removed the hand and arms for a purpose. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> I'm, and that was the thing that I was asking Gummer. I'm like, you know, how could the dog have eaten that hand if it's underneath her body? Explain that to me. And they, again, they just wow. don't answer any questions. And it's the same with the blanket. It's like you've got this blue blanket that is um, underneath the wife, but on top of David, but somehow David supposedly shot them all. And then I'm like, so what? Did he, you know, put the blanket down and then lay Kamel on top of it and then put Ronnie between her legs and then crawl under the blanket and shoot himself in the head? I'm like, does this make sense to you? After blunt force trauma. Exactly. No sense at all at this. But that, not. That's the icing on the cake right there. That, and if it's established that it was their blanket, yes. not, that's, that's a question there. Uh, could it have been somebody else's? Somebody else brought one in? I don't know. But uh, if it was their blanket, then that illustrates that they didn't handle it. And, you know, the forensics could indicate a lot of things. Somebody else was there, and they leave behind fibers, footprints. Uh, they couldn't do all of this without leaving evidence behind, unless they cleaned it up with the time they had. <laughs> well, see, and that's, and that's the, the kicker, too. I mean, there's so many smoking guns in this case. Um, with, for the amount of stuff that they're blaming on David, there is a curious lack of his DNA and his prints everywhere. That's there are no prints mean. and no, nothing anywhere. But yet they have um, prints that they can't match. So here you've got somebody else that was there, right? Yep. They ignore that. There, there's um, DNA of some sort from somebody else that does not match David, Kamel, or Rania. They ignore that. You know, then they, you've got this blue blanket that somehow mysteriously covers David while it's underneath Kamel, and they think that's normal. And then you've got, you know, these so-called foot, bloody footprints. When you look at them, they're not bloody footprints at all because 
you look, you see the photograph of this so-called bloody footprint with toes on the floor, and then you see the next slide where they're spraying it with a luminol type of product. They use something else. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head right now. But then you see underneath, you see the cleaned up blood that was brought up by this chemical. And, and there you see where they had cleaned it and wiped it before. And then the other stuff was put on top. The, the blood, their, their quote unquote footprints, were put on top of what was previously cleaned up. And they ignore that as well. Well, well, well. This stinks even more than before, as if it could. And uh, oh yes, it can. It, <laughs> yes, it can. This, this <laughs> is the height of a cover-up. I, I, I really, you know, cannot see logically how they could come to the conclusions they have. This is not only now a conspiracy, it's not a conspiracy, there is a cover-up. They yeah. are conspiring to cover this Which up. Which is a conspiracy. A cover-up requires a definite, more people. And it's more, and it's a more than, and it's more than one person. This takes a, a whole slew of people to bury this kind of thing. Multiple agencies, and it's like, why? That why is my... Help? Big question. Why would the state, the feds, and everybody turn a blind eye to three violent, dangerous people that were uh, involved in this that murdered these people in a heinous, horrible, and they were tortured also. This is evident. Yep. The family and, isn't, isn't asking questions. The family yep. has either been shut off, shut down, something or is threatened. Or, or, or threatened. threatened. But they are, they, are the big, they, are the they are the big wall. They are the big wall that we have to just keep climbing over. And that's a shame, but that means this is something that is very, very, very dark. And something is being covered up and uh, you can't say oh it's national security or whatever they're going to come up with but something as as the old adage goes there's something rotten in Denmark and it's sweeping over Europe you can't help but smell it and um, this is one of those things that um, if it smells rotten there's a body somewhere and something's got to give and eventually I think if we get those two stations in Colorado pinging on this and getting more interest and getting it onto a major, um, major, you know, who's going to major in the major networks or anything out there? Who's going to pick this up? Somebody might uh, for purposes because whoever's covering it up, they need to cover it up and they don't want it to get certain other people who would want to uncover it based on their opposing them. Who knows? There's got to be somebody out there in a position that wants to expose it and needs the right impetus, in my opinion. And I think if we keep going, and Catherine, if you get those two states, the blue blanket, the, the obvious problems that are with this, I think you might begin to slowly get some traction going. This may take years. Or who knows? Yeah, exactly. And that's the one thing I really want to stress to everyone. It's like what I've been saying in my yeah. last few days. The fight the has fight only is begun. Done. We're nowhere near finished. And this is right we this is where we have to stay the course and we have to dig in and we have to keep pushing this out there to as many people who will listen and just keep doing what we're doing. And I'm grateful that there are people like um, Dan Hennon and Greg and you and you know I can't even begin to tell you Brad what a blessing Dan and Greg have been for me personally with through all of the the stuff that's happened with this case you know but I think you know God's the Bible tells us you know all things are possible with Christ so yeah. I truly believe that this will get out there that that enough people 
whether or not the police actually change their, which they do need to, change their outcome, more than enough people are going to know the truth. Yeah, because the coroner had to look at this and go, what? <laughs> Well, this I'm really disappointed in the coroner, too. I mean, she had to have seen. There's no way she could have seen that skull piece because she picked it up and put it and fit it with David's skull, what was remaining of his calvarium. Mm. And how could she be handling this, seeing it? You and I see it in a photo. She had it in her hands and then state in the report that she saw no other evidence of um, trauma or, or injury. <laughs> I'm like, well, really? It's obviously a misstatement, or she doesn't, I'm not going to say she doesn't know what she's doing, but there's obvious problems with that conclusion right off the bat. Yes. It really is. My goodness. And I, I <clears throat> the coroner has to be part of it to come to that conclusion, and it would have to be told to do that, because no right coroner would come to that conclusion, in my opinion. Yeah, and it was um, interesting, and maybe it was pre-planned ahead of time or whatever, but I find it curious that not long after this case and the death of David's mother, she moved away from that area and then went to work in Wisconsin. So, yeah, she about her death, I, I heard that from Greg, and that raises some sticky questions. Yep. Because she would be one that would want the truth, in my opinion, and... Uh, was she involved in trying to do that? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I cannot, I go back and forth so many times on that one because I read the report and how it's written, and there's stuff that she left out completely, stuff she lied about, like saying she didn't see any further injury, which it's evident it's there, but then she also did leave little tidbits of gold about stating, it was early to moderate decomposition, um, you know, and that piece of skull fragment did fit David. So, I mean, this was very helpful, but at the same time, her final conclusion just leaves you shaking your head going, okay, it leaves you with no other option than to say they were told what to say and they stuck to the narrative and then they walked away. And that's what well, well, this, this is wrong. This, this is big because that means they were, this seems like a, you touched on something right there, we're saying pre-planned. This might have been a planned execution and is involving maybe the very agencies that are dealing with it. I, I was thinking about that. I didn't want to say it, but this could be indicative that maybe the police were involved. Maybe this is something more than just somebody, but a consortium of different agencies that may have been part of this for whatever reason, or one of the members who is a police officer or investigator or in office of some type had some interest in this. I don't know that, but it certainly smells like it. Yeah, it's definitely within the realm of possibility. I know I've spoken with so many people, and even including police officers, current officers, and retired officers, and there were several that made that same, that threw out that same scenario you just covered. Yep. They said, you know, this, is, this goes deeper than you think. And that was what was told to me at the very beginning when I very first saw the photo of the bodies. And, I mean, I just, now, mind you, I've seen dead people before. I, mm. I was an EMT for um, 10 years, and I um, had, like I said, I have a friend who is a deputy coroner, and I got to go in, and I've watched autopsies. So death is nothing new to me. But I saw this photo, and I'm t I had a visceral reaction. And I was just like, I jumped back and I just paced. And I'm like, oh, my God, they were murdered. They were murdered. And um, so when I started talking to other officers and other medical people, you know, the common um, response is, you need to walk away. This is bigger than you think. But I won't walk away. You know, that says a lot to me right there because I knew that would come up. That's why I brought up the scenario of officers. I said, somebody else is involved. This is, not, this is not random. This wasn't a random killer. This was an execution. Mm -hmm. and it was based on a directive from somebody somewhere in high position. In it's certainly opinion. looking like that, yes. And with that, that means that this person is existing, 
and wants this case to go away. And those officers telling you that, that was a veiled threat. And I know that offhand immediately. Yeah. And, uh, and in that, I pray that the wall they run into is the spirit if they try to execute anything on that threat. Because uh, they don't know what they're dealing with. They may think they do. But as I told Greg, when you're working with the spirit and you're guided by him, you will never go until it's his time for you to go. Exactly. Exactly. Point, if they get him to where he moves, they're in trouble. And it won't be fun. Yep. It'll be dead. <laughs> and I know that. I, I've had the joy of some, t not joy, but where I was protected in ways that, that caused discomfort for others. Uh, and they were just worldlings, as I call them, just doing their thing. Yeah. They weren't really meaning to harm or do anything, but they got some repercussions. They weren't severe, but it was enough to, that, that they didn't think it was related to me even. But it caused them to leave me alone. Hey, and, <laughs> God had your back. <laughs> and, and, and that's true. And that's why I'm in this. And I tell people, okay, you can come after me, do what you want. But I'm going to accomplish the goal that is set before me until it's done. When it's done, then the Father can let you kill me, do whatever you want, just to exemplify your greatness. And you think you've done something. But you're controlled yeah. by him as well as I. I recognize him. You have no clue. So understand that. Yep, and, and we have to always remember Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Right. And so if they come up and say, we're going to kill you unless you recant and say this, I will say the truth. Yep. And if it's the truth, I'll say it. But who are you? To exactly. Tell me if anything different. <laughs> exactly. And uh, that's where I stand right now. And I hope that if it came to that, that I would stick with it. I don't give myself, oh, I know what I will do. Because we each don't know under circumstances what we will do. But I do pray this. I say, Father, give me your feet. Give me your rock to stand on. And then don't let anybody knock me off. Amen. And so... Um, so that blue blanket was a big addition to the frosting on the cake. In fact, all this other evidence didn't, wouldn't have uh, even needed to be brought to me for me to initially look at it and go, oh, no, this was murder. It, it was a quick conclusion, too. And um, so, you know, we need to do another show. Uh, focus, basically, you know, as Greg would like, I think, on the bodies. And uh, let me have, let you do the closing on this show today, and then I'll just follow up with some prayer in my brief closing on that. And um, uh, then I'll close it with Proverbs uh, 3, 5, and 6, uh, and he'll direct us there. So uh, what are your closing words on this? And prep us for the next show in which we kind of focus on the bodies of David Crowley and his wife and daughter. Are you talking to Greg? No, I'm talking to you, Kat. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's been so quiet. Talk. It's like I always feel so bad. I always talk so much. No, you're That's fine. Good. That's yeah, good. We were having wrong with that. To, to do That's that. That's why we had so you. So we want you to talk. And, <laughs> yeah. um, you, you know, Catherine, don't, I need somebody to override me sometimes. <laughs> you know? I, I, we need to bring balance in there. You know, the yin and yang. The male, yeah. female, you know, we need a female voice in this, so please feel free. Oh, <laughs> well, you know. We need your voice. We <laughs> want your voice. Oh, you guys are kind. Thank you. Um, I just kind of would like to just kind of wrap it all up in a, in a nice, nice, you know, tight little bow. You know, the Crowleys were, it's a triple homicide. There is more than enough evidence. David, David's head suffered blunt force trauma. His head received a gunshot wound, and his head was also partially cut away from the rest of his body. That doesn't happen by somebody who kills themselves. Um, this family was targeted by either the informants or by the government or out of jealousy and anger and rage, but they were ruthlessly and without conscience, conscience 
murdered. They were slaughtered. And um, the local police don't seem to care. They're content with their decision, even though they know beyond a shadow of a doubt their decision is wrong. But that is why I believe God brings people like all of us together, because we will be the voice for those who can no longer speak for themselves. Yes. And, you know, in a final word on that, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just our path. It is his. Correct. He wants it. Amen. He guides it. And the best thing, he will be the final one to conclude it. And Amen. We need to let those who think you can walk away. My word to those officers and people who say that, you better walk toward it. Because there's a time that since you walked away, you're going to be brought back to this and face it in a very bad situation in which you will have to give an account. You think about it. You would tell us, you better think about what you do. And my word is, you is, you're not thinking, and you better start. That's my word. And Amen. with that, I close with a brief prayer. And thank you so much, Catherine. Well, um, thank you. Catherine Michelle. And this is Walter Bradley. And we're here with Greg, our great executive producer who brought this all about. Thank you, Greg. Thank and, you, Greg. And, and we appreciate all of you listeners who, hey, if you've got an input in Minnesota, start raising the flag. Start talking and start talking to the police and those there, we need some resolution on this case because there's no justice for these victims. And in that, I close home all to Bradley. This is Heart Talk, where we let Catherine Michelle share her heart on the quality murderers, not murder-suicide. So we thank you for listening. I close with prayer. Father, we wish to glorify you. Protect us. Give us voice. Give us strength. Be with Catherine and give her heart to keep this going as long as you empower us and give us the will and strength of your spirit to bring truth to the people. And we thank you for Greg in orchestrating all of this and bringing it to a wonderful, fruitful close. And we look forward to the next Heart Talk with Catherine Michelle as we discuss this horrible travesty and misjustice with the Crowley family. We thank you, Father, and bring it to your glory. Amen. Amen.